Before I roll into the homily, I just want to take a moment to tell you that I apologize if, if you see me wincing in pain. I injured myself on Thursday doing some yard work. I was moving a cactus, transplanting a cactus from one place in my yard to another place in my yard. And I, I was wearing gloves doing so, but the problem was when I bent down to put the cactus in its new home, uh, my back went out and the cactus fell on me and so I got little cactus spines, I've still got some bruises actually, but I got little cactus spines in my arms and I, I was kind of immobilized a little bit. My, my back is still pretty sore so you may see me uh, wincing as I get up and down and uh, you may hear this, this noise. Okay, so, so if you hear me do that, know that it's, it's me and not you, right? It's, uh, they, they say that. It's not, it's not you, it's me, right? That's, that's what's going on there. If you hear that uh, unfortunate noise, that's, that's why. So now we can move into the homily now that I've gotten that out of the way. And if I happen to twist funny and you, you hear me go, yeah, it's not part of the sermon. Uh, so I'll start by saying that one of the things that uh, I really admire about this congregation is that uh, you're a very spiritually mature uh, congregation of believers. And because of that, we don't need to go too far into detail about talking about Thomas in today's gospel, because we know that, that doubt can certainly be a healthy expression of our faith. Right? Doubt is not bad. Doubt is it's healthy. It's perfectly healthy to wonder, to ask questions. So we already know that. We don't need to go there, which is good. Because I think a lot of times when we have this gospel reading, it comes up every year on the second Sunday of Easter, uh, we tend to focus on, on that second half because it takes up such a big chunk of that gospel passage that it makes us overlook the previous part, which I think is probably more important. And because this is a spiritually mature congregation, we can jump into that more important piece of that scripture. And the more important piece of that scripture is that when Jesus appears to the other 10 disciples, remember Judas is not there anymore, and Thomas wasn't present, so when Jesus appears to the other 10 disciples, he breathes on them and he says, peace be with you. And he essentially uh, gives us what we now know as the sacrament of reconciliation. He says, if you forgive the sins of others, your sins are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of others, your sins are retained. So Jesus is giving his new priests, because now the disciples are the new priests, uh, the sacrament of reconciliation. So that's a very important piece of today's gospel. And because of that, in a number of Christian communities, today, the second Sunday of Easter, is known as what's called Divine Mercy Sunday. We don't have a theology of Divine Mercy Sunday specifically in the Episcopal Church, although I imagine there are a number of Episcopal congregations that, that observe Divine Mercy Sunday. But what Divine Mercy Sunday tells believers is that uh, if we are mindful of our sins, and we attend a church service, and we are mindful, and we make an effort to, uh, to do better next time, to, to avoid sin, and to do better next time, then we know that our sins are forgiven. That's what the theology of, of Divine Mercy Sunday tells us. Now, a number of years ago, um, I attended worship on Divine Mercy Sunday uh, in the chapel, the, the Catholic chapel at San Quentin Prison. Now, when I, when I tell people uh, that I've uh, served at San Quentin Prison, I have to be careful about how that phrase is spoken. Right? Because if I say, you know, I, I spent time at San Quentin or, or I did time at San Quentin, uh, I don't mean I did hard time at San Quentin. I mean I served as a, a chaplain intern. And part of the assignment was to attend worship with the inmates at San Quentin. And one of the days I happened to be there was on Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, the professor was a Jesuit priest. Uh, he's since retired, but he was a Jesuit priest and the Catholic chaplain at San Quentin. His name was George Williams. And you can read online. You can find 
material that George has written, and a very brilliant, very uh, pastoral man, wonderful man. And uh, in fact, if you uh, have access to CNN On Demand, there's a series that was on CNN. It was called The, the United Shades of America with a, a comedian named Kamal Bell. And Kamal Bell did an episode uh, at San Quentin, and he interviewed Father George in that chapel. He interviewed a number of the inmates there. And it was a, it was a little weird when I was watching that episode with, with my wife because uh, I was getting all excited. I know that guy, and I know that guy, and I know that guy. And, and many of these inmates I did know on, on a first-name basis. Right? So if, you, if you're interested, look up some of the writings of, of Father George because you'll, you'll find that he, he writes in a very uh, pastoral way. But on that day, the Divine Mercy Sunday, I walked out of the chapel, and when you leave the chapel, straight across the courtyard, there's a big, uh, long building, and it's called the Adjustment Center. And the reason they call it the Adjustment Center is because the inmates who have to be housed there, uh, they say, are adjusting to prison life. These are uh, inmates who have had uh, problems with, with guards and with other inmates, and so they're kind of kept in really solitary and confinement. They, they kind of said that these are the, uh, the most, uh, the, the worst of the worst is the word they use. I don't like that, that word choice, but that's the word choice they use. And if you go to the adjustment center to visit, you have to put on full armor. You have to put on a, a bulletproof vest and a mask and all, you know, full armor. You can't even go in there to, to visit. Right? And then just beyond the adjustment center and to the left is the rest of California's death row. Uh, so the adjustment center, most of the inmates there are on death row. Not all of them, but most of them. And then death row is behind and to the left. And walking out of that chapel that day and knowing it was Divine Mercy Sunday, it made me wonder, uh, what is divine mercy? And what is forgiveness? Because there, there are a lot of inmates at San Quentin. And at the time when I was serving there as, as a chaplain intern, there were 750 death row inmates in the state of California. Today there are 650. Uh, the 100 who, have, who are no longer on death row, uh, many of them have had their sentences commuted. Some have, have passed away. None have been executed because the, the state of California currently has a moratorium on on capital punishment, although it's still on the books. It's still technically legal in California. And it makes me wonder, where is the divine mercy? Right? Where, where is the divine mercy on Divine Mercy Sunday? And when we talk about Jesus' instructions to us uh, to forgive the sins of others, we ask ourselves the question, what, what does that mean? What does that mean to forgive? Because uh, we don't want this to be used in an abusive situation. We want to be mindful of that. We want to be mindful that, that sometimes people can use this as a way of perpetuating abuse and saying things like, oh, you have to forgive me because Jesus says so. Right? That, that, that can happen. Right? So I think... That kind of attitude is more like a forgive and forget kind of a thing. And we notice that Jesus isn't telling us to forgive and forget. He's telling us to forgive. Right? So sometimes our actions can have consequences. Now, for, for the inmates at San Quentin, for instance, their, their actions have the consequence of them being uh, imprisoned at San Quentin. Now, I have my own problems with... Uh, with the prison system in this country. I won't get into that right now, but society has determined that that, that is the consequence. Right? I don't like the term uh, punishment right? because it's not about punishment. It's about consequences. Sometimes our actions do have consequences. And sometimes when, uh, when we are harmed or when we harm others, maybe we have uh, consequences in our lives. I'm sure that we've all experienced pain. I'm sure that we've all experienced hurt from people in our lives. And sometimes there are consequences that go along with that. You know, for instance, uh, people who have, uh, you know, uh, 
I've, I've had, uh, you know, we've, we've, a lot of us have been bullied by classmates growing up, right? K kids, kids have a hard time growing up. I was bullied, for instance, because of my, uh, my weight all my life, right? Um, I've had uh, friends and family members who, who kind of didn't treat me very well, right? And maybe uh, the consequence of that is that to protect ourselves when we've been hurt, we might say, well, you know what, for my own best interest, I'm not going to continue to be in relationship with that person. It's not a punishment necessarily, but maybe removing ourselves from the, the toxicity of the situation so that we're getting ourselves out of harm. So, hey, that, that's, that's, that's appropriate, right? Um, because what happens when somebody hurts us or we hurt someone else is that that level of trust uh, diminishes. And the, the analogy that I like when, it, when I talk about trust, it comes from Brene Brown. She talks about trust as marbles that are in a jar. And as someone earns more trust, the jar gets more full of marbles. But then when somebody uh, betrays our trust, the marbles spill out all over the floor and the jar is empty. I mean, it takes a long time to find all those marbles and to put them back in. And sometimes... Uh, the, the marbles get spilled all over. Sometimes the, the jar breaks. Right? So it, it's really hard to uh, earn that trust again. So we don't have to continue on in an you know, active relationship. And maybe, you know, maybe at some point, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not even in this lifetime, maybe, some, maybe in the next lifetime, maybe at that point we can have a true reconciliation. Because remember, the, the sacrament is called the sacrament of reconciliation. That requires kind of a, a two-way street and a covenant. We talk about covenant. We talked about it last week. We talk about it again this week. It's kind of a two-way street. But why forgive in that case? What is, uh, what is the benefit in forgiving? And the reason is because then we don't have to carry it around on our hearts. Right? We don't have to carry around what we're, what we're holding on to. We don't have to worry about that. If we can forgive, then we can kind of let it go and we can go on with our lives. So the Greek word that Jesus uses here is an interesting word. And Greek is a, a complex language. It's much more complex than, than English. To modify English, you have to add words or take words away sometimes, right, to change the verb tense. But in Greek, all you have to do is change some of the letters in the word, and you can change the entire tense, the verb tense of the word. And the verb tense that Jesus uses here is when he says that you forgive, he says that those sins have already been forgiven. God already forgave those sins. Right? Now, it may not feel that great to know that somebody who offended us uh, has already been forgiven by God, right? but it's, it's sure nice to know that our sins have already been forgiven by God, right? so we can, we can take that with us. But essentially, it's not for us to worry about having to carry around someone else's burdens. We're responsible for our own burdens, but we don't have to... Uh, carry around someone else's sins. That, that's, that's for them to worry about. And if we can forgive, then it frees us up. It helps us to move on with our lives. And we regain control of the situation. It's, uh, it's just, it's not, it's not we, we forgive not for the other person, we forgive for us. And also what happens in this scripture passage, if we pay attention, we notice that it's kind of liturgical because Jesus begins his conversation with the disciples by saying, peace be with you. And that's something that we say in our service. In our prayer, in the, in the Book of Common Prayer on page 395, comes from this passage of Scripture. There's a prayer that, that we can say and it says, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. And we say that prayer right before we 
exchange the peace. And that's very intentional. It's very intentional that we do that at that time in the liturgy so that when we come forward to the table, uh, we can come forward without having to carry any of those burdens. We make peace with people who uh, perhaps we have offended or who perhaps have offended us. We literally make peace with those, with those people uh, as instructed by Jesus. And we do that so that we can come forward and receive communion uh, without having all of that weighing down on our hearts. So what we're going to do today on this, this second Sunday of Easter, we don't, we don't call it Divine Mercy Sunday, but this second Sunday of Easter, is I'm going to say this prayer out loud right before we exchange the peace. And then I'm going to have us pause for a few moments of silence. And when we do that, we're all going to reflect on perhaps people that maybe we have uh, caused harm to, or perhaps they have caused harm uh, to us. And we're going to uh, pray for uh, peace in our hearts. And we're going to be mindful and reflect on that. Now, if uh, by chance that person happens to be in this room, which it doesn't have to be, but if, if perhaps that person happens to be in this room, right, then we have an opportunity to actually go and shake that person's hand and say, peace be with you. Right? We have an opportunity to do that. We don't have to do that, but we have an opportunity to do that. Right? And that uh, highlights uh, what this reconciliation is all about. It helps us to, to give us that freedom to uh, not carry that toxicity and not carry that and not have that poison in our lives. So when, when we pray that prayer together, uh, we'll, we'll have a moment of silence and we'll reflect on that peace, that forgiveness that, that God assures us and also assures people who, who have offended us and for our own sake and our own peace of mind, uh, let's let it all go and let's put it in God's hands. Amen.